So welcome to the Campus Men cast from CCMA. We're really looking forward to a dynamic and interactive conversation today with Dr. Josh Packard of Springtide Research Institute. And Josh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is great. This makes me um, a Facebook celebrity now, right? <laughs> You're more famous than you were before. So <laughs> this has been my lifelong goal. <laughs> for folks who are just tuning in, feel free to uh, put any questions you have for Josh in the comment box on Facebook, and we'll make sure we get as many of those as possible. Uh, for those of you who've done Facebook Live before, it's always a very strange experience because you have Zoom on one side and you have Facebook on the other side of the screen and there's a little delay and uh, anyways, it's all good. So welcome aboard and uh, Josh, we're really, uh, again, looking forward to digging into some new data, some new findings that Springside Research Institute has unearthed and so many of our members, they want to know how can we understand young people better and how can we serve them? And ultimately, since we're a Catholic organization, how can we uh, help them to grow in their faith? But why don't we start with, uh, tell us a little bit about Springtide Research Institute. I know that you guys are fairly new. That's mm -hmm. not a negative in my book. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about uh, kind of the unique uh, niche that the Institute occupies. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, we are, we're just a year old and uh, uh, coming up this summer will be a year old. And, and Springtide was really born out of this, what, what we felt was both um, from practical and an academic side, that there just wasn't enough attention being paid to the well, the inner lives of 13 to 25 year olds. That this was, there's a lot of research out there, um, but a lot, I would say nearly all of it is done through a particular institutional lens. Um, and I, that, that makes sense. So, you know, in other words, like it's coming, it's research about Catholic youth, or it's research about, you know, Protestant or, you know, evangelical youth, et cetera. And sometimes very denominationally specific within that. That made sense for a long time, but, you know, what we've been seeing is that increasingly young people aren't leaving the church or their faith. They're not growing up with one at all. And so in order to really understand how they were, you know, asking and dealing with life's most important questions, it required us to go where the young people were, and that's what Springtide does. Uh, you know, we go, we go wherever they are and wherever they're answering and asking those questions. Um, and it takes us to some really interesting places. I'm sure it does. Yeah. And, and I mean, are you seeing um, as a statistician, as a demographer, as a researcher, are you seeing signs of hope? And, and again, we're going to get as deep as you want to go in terms of your new data, but from kind of the helicopter view, are you seeing signs of hope? Yeah, I really do. I mean, I think that this is the, what what our what I really think of our work at Springtide is doing is is accelerating the institutional responses to help match the reality of young people's lives on the ground because I think that young people are really exploring faith and religion in some real in some in some incredibly interesting and novel ways that are are pointing towards you know um, a reality where they're just as engaged as they've ever been in terms of the questions that they and the concerns that they have but that require a sort of institutional pivot in terms of how we meet them um, and equip them and, you know, to use a particularly Catholic term to accompany them along those, you know, those journeys of asking and answering those kinds of concerns. So I, I do find a lot of hope there. I've, you know, I want, like, I think a lot of us, like, I want the institution to hurry up <laughs> um, and, and meet the, because as much as young people can, can sort of do this work and they will produce, they will provide a lot of the energy, like, Things are not ultimately sustainable if we don't have really good structural solutions for them over the long haul. And so I think there's really a moment right now that we're, that is sort of calling the institutions to change a little bit. Not what they care about, not what they value, but their mode of delivery. Why would you say a, a lot of times institutions are very mm, resistant or just either suspect or um, skeptical resistant when they see data come out, you know, I mean, here's an example. There was, there was something that came out a few months ago about how um, a good percentage of Catholics didn't even understand, you know, the doctrine of the real presence in the Eucharist. And, uh, and, and I saw both sides. I saw people initially come out and say, Oh, this is awful. The sky is falling. And I saw some people on the other sides who said, Oh, the data is flawed. <laughs> do, do you do you see this sort of institutional angst when new data comes out yeah and i think that's um i mean there's a whole lot of really layered reasons behind that that you know we can we certainly could get into but very simply uh, 
I would say that it's part of what makes us different and unique at Springtide, which is the, I think people don't, I think people are rightly skeptical of a lot of that data because it's not particularly actionable. So let, let's put yourself in the shoes of somebody who works at a, at a local parish. What do you do with that number that, you know, X numbers of percentages of people don't understand the real presence doctrine in the Eucharist? Right. Like, how does that change or inform anything that you do? So in the, at Springtime, we always talk about that as um, interesting data. And, and we say internally, like, we never want to be interesting. We want to be useful. And, and so our research really is like guided and by that principle um, among a couple of others, but really trying to make sure that we're not just living in the land of, of like sort of intellectually interesting things, but producing insights that are coupled, you know, empirical things, data-driven, coupled with really good understanding of the social behavioral sciences so that we can produce things that are actually things people can use. Because if we can't use it, then it's just going to perpetuate and we'll have mm -hmm. the same conversation five or 10 years from now. And I don't well, think I think it's, don't do you, that. like, without that sort of like tie into direct action, that's where I think you get those people who are like, either on one hand, the sky is falling and on the other hand, the data are flawed. Like it just leaves it so much open to all of those things. And neither of those sides are wrong necessarily. Like maybe the data are flawed, I guess. Um, but like the point is like, nobody knows, right? Because they haven't, they haven't like, talked right. about the ramifications so people are right. having the wrong conversation so take us behind um some of the young adult research that had started before COVID 19. sure yeah <laughs> it's really interesting to launch a, an organization in the middle of a pandemic um <laughs> that was not the way we designed it but we were already paying attention to social isolation and loneliness in young people um before anybody had ever even heard of COVID-19. And that's because there's this trend that's been emerging for the last three or four years that people, I mean, it's been emerging for a while, but it's been identified from Cigna and some other people who have been doing the study, that young people are the most lonely and isolated generation uh, that we have in our country right now. And that's a distinct change. That's normally something that we associate with older generations. Um, and, and so this has never happened before. This is unprecedented that young people, and it's also, it's also sort of um, counterintuitive because we think of young people as super connected. They're always on their phones and they're you know, on social media and they have all these connections. But when, when you dig a little bit behind that, that image, you, what you understand is that, that, that being on social media and being connected doesn't mean that you feel like you belong somewhere. So the first study we did is called Belonging. I think it's actually right behind me, Reconnecting America's Loneliest Generation. Um, and it's a survey and then a bunch of interviews with young people to really help dig into that, like, you know, who does and doesn't feel lonely and isolated and why and how and what the mechanisms are behind that. And it was, um, it was, it was a great way to kick off Spring Tide and sort of demonstrate like what we care about and where our concerns are. And we also learned so much because we were wrong about so many things. Hmm. Give us an example. What were you wrong about? Well, we had this hypothesis and this showed up, you know, in the interviews a lot. We kept asking them, um, you know, where do you find a sense of belonging? And in fact, I, I sort of anticipated that we were going to be writing a report that documented, like, here's some really outstanding organizations or something. Um, and I, I remember like very early on having this meeting with my research team and they were like, just not, they were like, it, it doesn't work. The interview guy doesn't work. Like the questions, like they, the, they're not answering the questions. They don't know what to say. Da, da, da. And anyway, what we were able to figure out is that every time that we kept asking them where, the young people kept flipping it and telling us who. Hmm. And so that put this emphasis for us like squarely. When we, and then it, that was affirmed when we got the survey data back as well, that it's really about trusted adult relationships that give them a sense, that give young people a sense of belonging. Um, and that can happen in any number of contexts and that it decidedly wasn't anything to do with attendance. So uh, I'll, I'll explain that. Like we asked about, you know, are, do you belong to any sports teams or after school clubs or, you know, do you, do you have a place of employment? And then we also asked about religion. Do you attend religious um, events, services, gatherings, et cetera? And when you look at just the difference between those who attend uh, religious services versus those who don't, their loneliness and isolation numbers were exactly the same. Attendance made no difference at all. Um, it's not until it's not until you couple that with because we asked this other question of whether or not you have a relationship with a trusted adult at that place of worship um, or at that religious institution. When that came in, now we saw numbers start to plummet, like isolation, mm -hmm. loneliness numbers start to plummet. Um, 
And so that was just like incredibly eye-opening for us and, and really reaffirming this notion that we are living in this era where relationships trump everything. Hmm. That's a that's a bumper sticker right there. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're, we're talking with Dr. Josh Packard of Springtide Research Institute. If you have any questions on Facebook Live, we have a good number of people watching. Make sure you put those in the, the comments and I'll make sure I, I feed those over to Josh. Can I geek out for a minute um, and just ask it? What was the the what were the methods you guys used? Was it solely survey? Was it a combination of survey and interview? Was it group interview solo? Mm -hmm. Just uh, you know, allow me to just geek out for a minute there. Yeah, no problem. So in the last um, this so so in the last year we've surveyed now. 10,000 13 to 25 year olds um, and interviews with another 100 to 150 for belonging, which was our first report out of the gate. That was a, a and, and the surveys that we all do are nationally representative. Uh, so they, they match the census definitions for region, age, and gender, and maybe race. I can't remember if that's the uh, one, but we're, we want to make sure that we have something that's representing the entire country. And belonging is based on um, a subset of those, a thousand surveys and 30 in-depth interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews. And really crucially, I think what we do there is that's so important is that where a lot of other places stop at 18, you know, they'll go 18 to whatever. We, it, it's a little bit of extra, you know, effort, time, expense, et cetera, to get down to 13-year-olds. But we felt like that's so crucial because that's really the age at which, you know, a lot of faith formation decisions are taking place, a lot of identity creation, a lot of the traditional rites of passages, bar and bat mitzvahs, confirmations, mm -hmm. et cetera, are all going on right in that moment. And so we wanted to capture that as well as the transitions from like, you know, middle school to high school, which is its own thing, and then high school to whatever's next after that. So um, that's another unique angle. We, we always combine that quantitative numbers driven with something else. So whether that's interviews or um, on-site you know, visits, which obviously not doing now, um, <laughs> or focus groups, something like that. And to this, what we call data with heart, like our goal is not just to report, but it's to understand so that we can make, you know, critically informed decisions about like the, and, and give it, you know, some insight to where people should be headed. Here's a question. What were the key components of a relationship with a trusted adult that did those surveyed identify what they mean when they use terms like belonging and isolation and lonely? Yeah. So we, um, that, that's a great question. And I think that's one that everybody um, should be thinking about here. And at the end of the book, like because of the, or at the end of the report from belonging, we're able to identify this process of belonging that it's, it's actually proceeds in stages. Um, that we call noticed, named, and known. And so what was, that was what was really great about the data. And that's what I mean about being actionable, which is that we're, we were able to actually identify the ways that, okay, if you can first make sure somebody feels noticed, because young people tell us all the time, um, told us consistently that they, they feel like they are not seen, they, that they literally feel invisible. And so the simple act of noticing somebody makes a big difference. Um, only after the noticing part can you start to move into the stage that we call named, which is, yes, it means that you know somebody's name, but there's more to it than that. Um, and then based on those two, you can move into this part where they feel known, that you understand their life well enough to know, like not just a checkbox of like what happened in their life, but how they experienced the events that happened in their life. And if, if you can get those three together, in a group setting, then you'll start to create this feeling of belonging. Um, and without any one of those steps, we found that the belonging, like that, that sense of belonging that you're hoping for to combat the isolation and loneliness, that, that it doesn't really emerge. If it does, it's temporary and not super durable. That foundation of noticed name known is really crucial for creating those long-term results. So brass tacks, I have a high school student and he goes to his parish youth group and then we, and the, the young priest who's a year or two ordained, he's at the youth group, you know, maybe there's 20 students there over the course of a couple months, you know, one would think that you could get down 20 names or so, you know, mm -hmm. and then we, we will see the priest at mass on Sunday. It sounds like what you're saying is the data says that if that priest simply knows my son Thomas's name, acknowledges him and starts to 
uh, make him feel welcome. Sounds like you're saying those simple things could make a tremendous difference in terms of isolation and loneliness. Yeah, I, but I think we need a lot more sophistication there. That it's like that is at, at, at its basic level. That's what we're trying for. Um, but what we've where we've been living is in this world of like these really program driven models, uh, which were super effective for a very long time. But we've got some pretty important evidence that the world has shifted, not just for young people, but for everybody in the last um, really 20 to 30 years, which is that we don't, we don't have the same institutional trust that we used to have um, anymore. So just because you have the role of a pastor or a priest, um, or just because you occupy, you, know, you have certain credentials and diplomas on the wall, um, doesn't mean that, that people will necessarily listen to you. And, and that's a, that means that those program responses that are seen as part of the institution, like they're just not, they're not gonna have the same kind of resonance. That's, that's why, like we, I think, you know, like that's largely why we found that, that um, attendance didn't have the effect where once I think did. So even when I think I was growing up, like attendance, like if, if I went somewhere, it meant that I felt like I belonged there. And now those two things are just decoupled, that people attend a whole lot of things where they don't feel like they necessarily belong. Uh, and I think it's time that like we really need to bring the same kind of sophistication to relationships as we have been bringing to our programs that we that were you know we put so much energy and effort into. Um, so in a very practical sense, then um, you know we talk about measuring what matters and the what what we call what I sometimes refer to as nickels and noses like donations and you know how much time you know, how often you came to something um, and sat in the pew that used to be a really good marker for the thing that we cared about of commitment, right? But those are not good markers of commitment anymore. We should stop measuring them as <laughs> indicators of commitment. They might be useful as indicators of something else, but they are not indicators about whether or not somebody feels like they belong and are committed to your organization. We need to start tracking and measuring the things that actually matter with regards to spiritual development, faith formation, and relationships. And that can be done as simply as tracking everybody on a spreadsheet against a spiritual development guide or, you know, what, what I've seen some people do, which is really, you know, in, in terms of scaling up, which is putting this all into like basically a CRM for faith formation, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which allows I'm, them, you know, it sounds kind of funny, right? But what it, yeah. it, like there are other places in the world that do relationship based components for their business. Uh, or their organization, and it allows them to scale up those things. So you can bring in volunteers without losing continuity in a relationship. And, you know, you can expand into building a culture of belonging as opposed to just, you know, how, cause how many relationships can one person have really, right? And like that's many, not the goal. And how many events can, can a ministry possibly do? And then the right. pressure of, oh my gosh, how am I going to top last week's or last month's <laughs> thing? Yeah. And and one person can only make so many connections at those. Right. And it's the bigger they are, the easier it is for somebody to feel um, just kind of anonymous in that kind of program or event. Here's a question, Josh, in a virtual world that we're currently in and, and probably will be in, in campus mm -hmm. ministry for a while, that, that seems likely, how do we help students be noticed, named, and known? And are there any virtual habits that we can put into place to accomplish this? This is such a great question. Um, the, it, it, the, I think there's, there's a twofold answer here. And, and one I can, you know, just sort of toss out pretty quickly, which is uh, there's this ritualistic side of this that I think is really useful in terms of the scaling component where we're getting people, um, you know, to, to feel like they're part of a larger group. And I'll, I'll put in a plug here for um, on our research advisory board is Casper Tukil, who has this new book about rituals coming out, coming out this summer um, and really talks about how to create uh, rituals in a modern world. And I'm, I'm, I'm irritated that I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's pretty easy to find. Um, and I think, I think it's, we can create these new kinds of rituals about how we gather and what we do when we're together and how we just even like bring in the beginning and the end of a day. Um, because I think for me anyway, that's been one of the weirdest things about all these stay at home orders is like time just Blurs has together. changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. so weird. Right. Um, on a, on a much, on a much more individual perspective, I've seen so many places doing just like really phenomenal things. So here, let me give you like, this is my favorite example from last week. There's this organization that I, it's a parachurch ministry. Um, and they, all their mission trips for the summer are canceled. Like yeah. they're gone, right? But they, but, but they don't care about mission trips. What they care about is service. 
right? That's crucial. The, the, the fact that they know that is absolutely essential. They understood the mission trip as just a mode of delivery for imbuing this value of service. And so what did they have? Well, they've been playing video games with their kids. And so what they've been getting their young people to do is to join in these big, you know, these big online virtual world video games, Fortnite or whatever. And then they pick somebody who's, which you can't really win on your own anyhow, right? Mm -hmm. So they as a team pick somebody who's playing alone and then they just basically like give them all the stuff. Like they, they make it so that that person has a team on their side and there's mm -hmm. no ulterior, you know, is this like solving world hunger? No, let's not be, you know, but is it a, is it a way to like, get across the value and importance of service to others without expecting anything in return. Absolutely. And like that young person who like, they didn't do anything to earn it. They just like showed up and played a video game. And now all of a sudden, like they've got this team fighting and playing on their behalf and solving puzzles with them and giving them insights and like, how great would that feel? Right. So, it, you know, we've, we've seen all kinds of people like making door drop delivery things to people and, and care packages and really just doing outstanding kinds of work. Mm. Um, but it all revolves, I think, around that central insight of what am I doing that is a mode of delivery and what am I doing that's an actual value thing that we care about? Because once you can separate those two out, then you can, you know, you can fill around with the modes of delivery. All day. If you're not a video game person, I'm not suggesting you go play video games. Right. Um, but, you know, like whatever it is that fits your skill set, then you can do. Well, don't bring up Fortnite in this house because, I mean, that's practically like a fifth child in my family is Fortnite. Oh, my gosh. Please, no more Fortnite. Please, but, no more but, Fortnite. Yeah, my son, is in, my son is a little bit younger. He's 10, so we're doing loads of Minecraft. Right? Oh, I've been there, my friend. I've been there. Loads okay, of let's, let's pivot to uh, COVID-19. Let's pivot sure. to um, tons and tons and tons of young adults living either alone or mm -hmm. living alone, but with a small group of other people, what has the data shown? And have you guys been able to update or refresh some of the initial findings from belonging? Yeah, we thought this was really important. So this is, uh, we wanted to get something in, out in the field so we could dig into this a little bit. Um, and so we put, just for time purposes, because it does take a little more time, like I mentioned, to survey 13 to 17 year olds. We, this is just 18 to 25. And a couple of weeks into the first day at home orders at the end of March and beginning of April, we were asking them about like, how are you doing? How are you coping with this? What, what, are, you, what are you doing to try? How lonely do you feel, et cetera? And there were, there were some just like, uh, you know, nothing particularly surprising in terms of the acceleration of loneliness and isolation. We would all expect that. But then there was this really fascinating um, sort of like these two data points that were in conversation, at least for me, they're in conversation together, which is that uh, nearly half of young people had tried some kind of new religious activity during the first couple of weeks of stay at home orders. So they were praying more, they'd watched an online service, uh, maybe they were meditating, who knows what it was. Um, and yet, only 1% of them had been reached out to by a religious leader. So like in other words, the story that emerges for me then in that is that you've got these, like you have these young people who are really hungry and exploring for like how to make meaning and sense of all the stuff that was going on. But the experts who were supposed to be, like the people who we would think of as the experts to guide them through that process, largely non-existent. Um, you know, and not to put too fine a point on it, but if you're asking me, like, if I think your time is better spent connecting one-on-one -on -one with a young person who's trying to figure out what this means or live streaming your service, like, that's a no-brainer to me. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I'm not saying you can't do both because I think you can. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we this, this uh, crisis has exposed, I think, a lot of us, a lot of ministries, a lot of apostolates, and some have been able to really pivot and embrace new things mm -hmm. and change and put a human... Uh, element to a lot of technology and then there have been some that have really struggled um, so what is it is it a lack of preparation is it a fear of getting back to basics in terms of one-on-one -on -one <laughs> communication I mean I don't know if you can take a guess but why did only one percent reach out to these young people who are trying and obviously hungry for something some new yeah. spiritual expression well, I, I do think it's a misunderstanding that lies at the root of this. And, and that misunderstanding um, revolves around uh, 
really that central change with regards to trust. So for a long time, the church has been telling itself a story where the church is the primary main actor in that story. And the world sort of happens, you know, as a supporting cast around the church. And um, that's not, that's just not true. The, it, I, don't, I don't mean that to say that the church is unimportant, but that there are other things going on out in the world that dramatically impact the ability of church to do church in the way that church wants to do church. Um, and that thing, that, that sort of big forest level thing that's impacting that individual tree is the, is the, lock, the, the sort of lack of institutional trust. Now, when you see it as like, oh, I'm the central actor in this story, you think about that as like, a, I need to rebuild trust period. Like it's like, for whatever reason, young people and others aren't attracted to me. So I need to make them, you know, I need to be more trustworthy and attractive. But the, the actual story that's being told is that people don't trust institutions at all. It's like, when we look at the data here, it's overwhelmingly conclusive. It's not that churches have done a bad job. It's just that like, we don't trust big businesses. We don't trust mm -hmm. banks. We don't trust the government. We don't trust, mm -hmm. you know, public education and on and on and on. Where the church has been a little bit slow on the uptake there is that each of those other industries have pivoted. They've created like these alternative ways of, of getting out of that. They've recognized that like, oh, I can't rebuild trust because something is fundamentally sort of at a social level broken. So we need to think of new ways that we are doing this. So, you know, if we don't trust say like big, large scale, you know, agriculture like we once did, you look at the largest buyers now and purveyors of organic foods, it's Walmart and Costco. Well, that's crazy, right? Uh, I mean, that's not what you would expect from them, but that's part of how they're mitigating that. Um, as we lose trust in public education, we've seen the rise of, um, of homeschooling, charter schools, those kinds of things. Religion just hasn't quite yet developed those kind of alternative responses. And I think it really is that like, fundamental misunderstanding that like the problem that's happening right now is not something that they can fix. And that's a, like, once you understand that, then it becomes a lot easier to pivot. So in these moments when like the institution is fundamentally no good at connecting to people in the middle of a stay at home crisis pandemic response, like their sort of response is just like, well, wait it out. Like, I think that's why we have this, like, well, we don't have a tool for that <laughs> because like, we don't, we don't do relationships at scale. That has not been a tool set that we've developed. I don't mm. think it's for lack of intent or desire. Mm -hmm. I think there's like, you know, one of the things that we say at Springtide all the time is, we see, we hear stories all day from young people who intensely want and desire expert adults in their lives to help guide them. And I do webinars like this and talk to lots of groups where like I hear from well-meaning adults who desperately want to connect with young people so they can be that guide, but they don't always like have the way to bridge those things, right? So I think it's primarily yeah. like that's what it is. I don't think it's, you know, people's, you know, not wanting to. Years ago, I, I worked in New Hampshire and I used to bring students to a field trip to uh, Timberland Boot headquarters in New Hampshire. Yeah, and I, I absolutely loved it because they basically said, we have to serve people at a super high level or we go out of business. And mm -hmm. in Timberland at the time, I don't know if it's still true, but they also had a, a, a social mission as well. And they felt like you could make money and you can make a difference at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, I wanted the church to see that, that businesses do have to pivot and respond. Um, here's a question from uh, Nick Stein. Hey, Nick. He says, could you give examples of how some of those other industries have pivoted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So, um, and the one you brought up about Timberland is a really good example. I mean, another brand that I would say has done a really good job of that um, is Patagonia. So, you know, you think about like their, their at Patagonia, they keep, they say all the time, like, we want you to own, they, they sell things, right? They make and sell things, right? And they tell you out, out, outright, we want you to own fewer things, own fewer good things. Um, and they have the, you know, they have the same like mission driven organization that attracts young people. In fact, we have a book coming out this summer called Meaning Making, the eight values that drive America's newest generations. And, and it really is our attempt to, to use a lot of those case studies and explain why like the traditional values that motivated people to engage with an organization, either through employment or volunteering um, or for spiritual purposes or whatever, like a lot of those values have sort of eroded and that these, these newer values are sort of standing in the place there. They're, you know, organizations that are accountable and inclusive, you know, that are, that are um, mission driven and meaningful. These are the ones that attract young people because they're the ones that 
that are sort of in touch with this new reality that just says like, because we, you know, the old McDonald's slogan of like 50 billion served or whatever, like not only does that not resonate with young people, it's actually a turnoff, right? So these, you know, the smaller, the more local, the more contextualized things are, uh, the more value driven that they are, the better off they can be, which I think means that churches have like, they're ideally positioned to do this kind of work if they'll just sort of take a step away from that program for a minute mm. and start digging into the relationships. What's in your crystal ball as churches start to reopen? Have we just lost uh, more people or do you anticipate <laughs> that young adults who've now tried uh, some new things online, perhaps related to their faith are, should we expect that they're going to go back? It's a good question. Um, you know, we're, we've actually got, uh, we're working with um, uh, American church group and parable success group that um, primarily serves a Protestant market, but to do a survey right now about that, like what are people expecting when they go back to church and who's going to go back and when? And, and a lot of that is, I think, going to be driven, you know, like what we're going to see is this, um, I would imagine that to, to use business terms here, Q3 and Q4, we're going to see, you know, cause it's not going to be like this, uh, everybody's open, everybody come back to church all at once, mm -hmm. but we will see relatively high attendance uh, markers during the second half of this year. Um, but you know, if you don't do anything about that, if you, if, if my fear is that the church will see that as like, see, we knew that you'd come back and they don't do anything different. And then by January and February, we're right back to the old patterns. What are your thoughts on social media? Waste the time overinflated. <laughs> is this a, a way to build relationship? How does that fit in? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's critical, right? I mean, you've got to be like, it, it, you've got to be online at some level. Um, and, and, uh, but nothing matters if it's not authentic. So if you can't be authentically online, don't be online. It's that's worse. Right. Uh, I don't, I don't really go much in for these bells and whistles. I mean, social media is a tool of communication in the same way that, um, chat rooms once upon a time were a tool of communication in by telephones, et cetera. Um, if it's a tool that you can use that makes sense with your ministry, figure out how to use it. Um, I, I think right, what I see too often right now is that people look at those things and say, I don't understand it or I don't know it. And that drives their decision making instead of letting like what's best for young people drive their decision making. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you come to this conclusion that being on Instagram is probably the best way to reach young people, then you should learn it <laughs> and you should get yeah. on it. Yeah. <laughs> Like, it doesn't seem all that hard to me. I mean, there's something like, you know, <laughs> however many tens of millions of people using Instagram, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure we can figure it out. <laughs> if Kim Kardashian can figure it out, then I, <laughs> I'd like to think we have a good shot. And figure it uh, out really well. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And you don't need to pose in front of a million dollar car. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thankfully. How about, um, you know, and what, in which ways is this COVID-19 perhaps forever change? How has it forever yeah. changed young people? Well, I, I'll say this, like, I don't think it has, and I don't think it will. Um, you know, it's, it is accelerating trends that we saw that were already in place. You know, again, the, the research from belonging came out before COVID-19 and the research that we did during it confirmed that those, the pace of that, ex, of that change was just accelerating a little bit. Um, I'll soften that just a little bit to say if, if let's, let's say this goes on for another few months, like let's say by and large, you know, especially as we move into summer, which is often a little bit of a downtime for campus ministries and, and uh, youth groups and things like that. If, if kids go from say March to August without feeling like anybody in the church is reaching out to them and cares about them specifically, I think it would be really hard. It would be a long road back to convince them that you cared. I mean, I, that's not based on any particular data. Um, like we haven't asked kids that question. We haven't asked young people that question. Um, but that would be, I just think like, I personally would find that very, I, I think my own, like my own instinct would be like, well, where were you in, in June? Like when I was right. at home with no school for the third week in a row or whatever. So I know you're not a campus minister, but speak to our, our audience who are primarily campus ministers. You're not saying that programs and events are bad, but finish that sentence for me. Yeah, but I think they can be distracting. Um, the, and I'm, I'm not a campus minister. I am a 
a college professor, so I'm acutely aware of what camp, what, you know, what campuses are like. And, you know, I think that here, here's the thing that I think is problematic about pro, about, about doing program-based ministry in a relationship-driven world is that it allows you to go to bed every single night and think, man, I did good work today. Like, I worked really hard. I was busy all day, made a lot of progress on that, got those logistics squared away. But like in this weird way, the sum total is less, the, the total is less than the sum of its parts. So like you can go to bed like that every night for a year, but you won't have made any progress on actual faith formation with young people in the same way that you might have say 15 or 20 years ago. That you'll just be every day, you'll, you'll feel like you're getting stuff done, but you'll be losing ground. Interesting. So I, I work, I sit on a board for a nonprofit in uh, Uganda. And, and one of the things we say- Oh, where is, in Uganda? Uh, Soroti. Yeah. And Madeira. Uh, yeah. We were just there a couple of years ago. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful country. But I mean, so you've seen, I mean, the, the primacy of water and access to water yeah. is so important. Sounds like if there's, you know, maybe a metaphor, sounds like you're saying relationship really is the new, the new king in terms of this um, operative effect of the church. Yeah, the, uh, we'll have an annual report coming out on the state of religion and young people. It'll be this, it'll come out this October. And, you know, it's really us summing up that 2020 is the year that, you know, relational authority became the only authority that matters in the lives of young people. And, and that concept of relational authority is one that combines sort of your lived experience as it intersects with a young person's lived experience, plus your expertise, you know, that it's not, it's not like we're only digging into like, like living through anecdote or dear diary kinds of things. People really do care. Young people really do care about your expertise, but it has to be combined with personal care. And, and so that create, if you can do those kinds of, if you can do those two things together, that, that develops what we call your relational authority. And the, the impact of having relational authority in a young person's life is tremendous. You know, you'll have the kind of influence that you really want to have over their decision making and, and understanding of their values and what drives them and motivates them. Because young people, they will find that authority through YouTube or whatever. And, and those authority figures are actively reaching down, reaching out to young people. So they're going to somehow meet in the middle in some way. So mm -hmm. all the more important for the church to, the church already has, you know, so many of the pieces. It's just about, uh, as you say, building and being maybe more overt and explicit about that relational authority. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, and, and really building systems around relationships. Okay, so I guess last question, we're talking with Dr. Josh Packard of Springtide Research Institute. And uh, again, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. Uh, last question I have, Josh, is if there's one takeaway from your most recent data into young people, what is it? Oh, wow, that's what a great question. Uh, Such an unfair question, but. <laughs> if there's one takeaway. <laughs> I would I would say that you you really can't um, you really can't underestimate how much young people are looking for and desiring trusted adult relationships, and the I get especially especially in a Catholic context. I know the question that's coming. If, if there's not somebody typing it right now, they're they're about to, um, which is you know with the safe and sacred, like how can we be in relationship with people with young people in this in this one to one kind of way. Um, you know, we're prohibited or barred from doing that kind of stuff in many cases. Uh, and I'll say that I, I've not yet seen a place where you couldn't, with some creativity, figure that part out, you know, whether it's, and, and in fact, I think there's really an opportunity here for you to convey to parents how much you do care, like you take their safety, their, their children's safety so seriously, and you're willing to go to these links of like, you need to be in the room when we're having the Zoom chat, and like, I'll send you the recording afterwards. I've seen places that are you know, when they're playing video games with young people, they make sure that they're either never playing alone or they're literally filming themselves in their living rooms and like mm -hmm. making that available in the cloud if any parent wants. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this way because I think like we live in this world where we know all the safeguards that are in place, but parents and, and people who aren't connected to the church, they only see headlines, right? And, and the safeguarding policies never make the headlines. It's always the transgressions. So it becomes this way to like repair some of that damage by, by going that extra mile to say that, and, it, and it's worth doing, because if I were to sum up it, to sum up all of our research, you know, it would be to say, there's nothing that can replace the trusted adult relationship in the life of a teenager. That those, those guides are, in fact, and, and they're just, there's such, there's such short supply. Something like 40% of young people have one or fewer trusted adult in their lives, and that includes their parents. 
Mm. And that's just not enough. It's not enough to combat mm. the impacts of isolation, loneliness, distress, mm. et cetera. It's not enough. And yet the flip side, it, it is, I mean, it's tragic, really. It's a heartbreaking reality. But the good news is you could be a caring adult number two, which might yes. make a dramatic difference. Absolutely. And it's not, you're not just speaking like off the cuff there. I mean, we've got research that can that actually, in, in belonging, we show the research about how much the difference of going from zero to one makes in one to two. And then, you know, the magic number is five. You can get to five young adults, mm. uh, five adults in a young person's life then we see the numbers you know, for those things sort of drop down to like single digits. Wow, that's amazing. Um, all kinds of questions here. So one question is, uh, this leads me to ask, how does or should relational authority relate to the appropriation of the faith or the making the faith your own? And then another question is, how do young people define authenticity in a relationship? <laughs> how do you, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure. I mean, do you have five to, hours? <laughs> yeah, right. Trying to get young people to, to uh, identify high level concepts can be, can be interesting. Um, and that's what we have a really great um, head of research at our, uh, at Springtide who does a good job of getting at those things at age appropriate levels. Cause obviously the way you ask a 14 year old is not the same. We ask a 20 year old. Uh, but to say that, um, We've taken this, there, there is this, uh, these two things coincide here in this moment where um, authenticity is really about uh, providing space inside of a relationship for young people to grow. Now, in other words, like they're not being driven by your artificial timeline um, where like you think that they should be confirmed in the next eight weeks. Well, if that young person doesn't believe that, that or, or if they live in such a reality that makes you know, being confirmed in the next eight weeks, like not something that they can commit to or do or that their family can't do. We've often had like no other outlet for that to happen. And so in terms of that appropriation and authenticity part, like I think, I think it really is incumbent upon us to understand what the, say, let's take that example of confirmation. What is the point of confirmation? What are the necessary steps to that? And how can we track those things? Because I'm pretty you know, I'm not the foremost biblical scholar, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't have to happen, you know, at, at your, at your parish on Wednesday nights for the next eight weeks. Like I'm pretty sure that that's not in the new Testament. Um, and so when you, when you start to take that approach to it, then young people see you as like, Oh, you're intensely interested in me, not the number of people coming through confirmation over the next couple of months, but you care about my faith development. Mm. You, you will be here with me from the beginning to the end. And that's where we get this, co this coinciding of authenticity and care, relational authority and spiritual development. So it sounds very simple. I don't mean to say that everything is just about timeline. What I mean to convey mm -hmm. is that it, it's about really understanding what you care about and, what, and how it inter intersects with what a young person needs. So it sounds like what you're saying is you can lead and also you can um, find space to be patient with that young person's organic and, and sometimes... <laughs> inconvenient growth. Sounds like you can do those two things. Is that what I'm hearing you say? You can lead them and you can love them and you can walk with them. Yeah, I don't, not only can you, but I don't, I'm not sure that there's really, um, I'm not sure there's really a long lasting approach to faith if you do it the other way around. I mean, one of the things that we know, this, this is just something from sociology, I'm a sociology professor um, uh, at the university. I mean, that's my training. One of the things we know from this from sociology is that uh, belonging, a sense of belonging, is actually the way that it has to come first if we're going to create a, a really solid foundation for long-term belief. And that's not just true in religion; it's true of anything. Whether you're trying to get people to to really commit to a democracy, for example, um, a new political system, or, or to have faith in a judicial system, whatever it is, belonging precedes believing. And we always get into trouble as a society, whatever the institution is when we flip that on its head and we try and force the believing part to come first and think that a sense of belonging will emerge afterwards. It's, it's sort of, it's more, um, I don't know, it can be really enticing at first because it looks like we're making progress faster, but the, it, the long, over the long haul, the, it, it's less durable of a set right. of beliefs. It doesn't stand up or hold up as well to the other kinds of things. So really like ensuring that you're doubling down on that belonging thing, that you know them, that they are part of the group, that they feel that sense of belonging. And you'll be surprised, I think, at how much more durable people's faith is after that. Hmm. Well, we're going to have to 
cut you off there. And uh, I hope you will take a, an invitation a few months down the road from us when you've got some new research out. Uh, you bet. We'll be, we'll be eager to unpack that as well. And uh, you've given us a few gems today that we're going to need uh, some time to chew on. So Dr. Josh Packard from Springtide Research Institute, thank you very much for being our guest. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. Uh, if people want, they can. I'm Josh at springtideresearch.org, or we're on social media at We Are Springtide across all platforms, I think. Hmm. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you again, Josh. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye bye.